Mulligans are something that I see many players, both new and experienced, really not take full advantage of. Many people seem to be complacent with their mediocre starting hand because they're hesitant to start the game with one less card. I've seen people who absolutely refuse to mulligan altogether. In a perfect world, we draw amazing hands all the time, but that's not reality. While definitely not ideal, taking a mulligan is a powerful tool, and the drawbacks aren't as scary as they may seem. In today's episode of Keyforge Concepts, we're going to take a look at mulligans, when you should mulligan, why players don't take mulligans, and the math behind our starting hands. At the start of the game, players will randomly determine which one of them will play first. This is usually done by dice roll or by coin flip. After shuffling their deck, the starting player will draw a hand of seven cards, with the player going second, drawing one less up to six. After receiving their starting hand, each player will have an opportunity to take a mulligan, discarding their hand, reshuffling their deck, and drawing a new starting hand with one less card than their original, which would be six if playing first, or five if playing second. Remember, you may only mulligan once per game. So after taking a mulligan, you need to work with what you have. Before I get into what to consider when deciding to mulligan, I want to quickly talk about why mulligans aren't actually that scary and why you shouldn't be afraid of them. From what I've heard from people in my experience, I believe the overarching reason why people hate taking mulligans is because having less cards in hand is worse. I think this is misguided and mostly untrue in Keyforge, and I think it stems from habits brought over from other card games. In most other card games that offer mulligans, having less cards to start is worse because you're typically only drawing one card to start your turn. You're basically playing the entire game from behind with a one card disadvantage. In Keyforge, this point is moot. It does not matter how many or how little cards you play because you are always replenishing to a full hand of six. Let's take a theoretical example of someone in a game going first. In our first scenario, this player does not take a mulligan. They play one card, and since that is the limit of what they can play on their first turn, they end their turn. They don't draw since their hand is already at six. In our second scenario, this same player does take a mulligan, which leaves their starting hand at six. They play one card, and they end their turn. Since they end with five cards in hand, they draw one card, up to six. Going into their second turn, both players have played one card, and both players have six cards in their hand. There is literally no difference or loss in this scenario. The only difference is that the player in the second scenario had two chances to find a strong starting hand. Mulligans as the first player are incredibly safe. Even going as the second player, yes, you lose one card you could have potentially played. However, when we dive into the numbers later in this video, you'll see that a card missed will most likely not come into play in the long run. You are not missing out on as much as you think you are. When you're deciding to mulligan, there are three major things to take into consideration. The first thing to look at are the actual cards in your hand. The first two videos in this series were all about what to look for in a starting hand, so feel free to give those a watch if you're interested or want a quick review. What I actually did not touch on in those videos is cards that you do not want to see in your starting hand. As we go through these cards, you'll see that for the most part, these are generally strong or valuable cards. However, they do not offer anything near their potential value at the very start of the game for different reasons. Heavy Amber Control cards, like Too Much to Protect, have minimal value early on simply because there's just not enough Amber in play to make them useful. Board Wipes, like Gateway to Dis, have decreased value as well because the board hasn't had a chance to develop yet. Board Wipes are much more useful as an emergency reset card later in the match. Finding half or even both cards of a certain card combo, like Tribute and Six Semper Tyrannosaurus, aren't ideal either. And finally, you aren't going to be able to use key cheat cards like Key Charge anytime soon, so once again, they're wasted space. By holding on to any of these cards, you're forcing yourself to either play them for minimal or even no value, discard them from your hand, or just let them sit in your hand, where they're going to take up a potential draw spot. You will basically play the game with five cards in your hand until you're finally able to get that card out of your hand and use it. 
there is also the added downside of giving your opponent information by removing these threatening cards from your hand especially if you're playing a format where you can look at your opponent's deck list before the match like standard archon if you play your too much to protect for amber early in the game then your opponent doesn't have to worry about being punished for having high amber counts if you discard your only board clear on turn two then your opponent can swarm the board with creatures with relative safety cards that clog your hand early game like this warrant strong consideration in your decision to mulligan the second thing to take into consideration when taking a mulligan is the house distribution of your hand, or how many cards from each house you have. The more cards from the same house you have, the more potential cards you can play in a single turn. This means that the most efficient hand will always be only cards of the same house, while the least efficient hand would be having an equal distribution of houses in your hand, which would typically be two cards from each. Now, unless you popped your deck out of the plastic and played without shuffling it, you're probably not going to be pulling six card plays every turn. So we need to do some math and take a look at the statistics ourselves. Luckily, someone has already done the math for us. A Reddit user by the name of Blinking Line made a Reddit thread in early 2019 in which they outlined the probabilities of every single house combination in a starting hand. The math checks out, so a big thank you to them and their contributions to the Keyforge community. All the numbers I use in this section are taken from their thread. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested in taking a look yourself. Let's take a look at a hand of seven first. In the rightmost column, you will see that I've color coded the likelihood of pulling each hand combination, with green being the highest probability and red being the lowest. You will also see that I've also color coded the leftmost column as well. These numbers represent the most cards of a single house that we will have in our hand. This number is important because, as just mentioned, we generally want to be playing as many cards as we can from our hand. The more cards we play, the more creatures we have, more amber, and the faster we can cycle our deck. So the more cards from a single house in our opening hand, the better. This is even more true during the first turn of the game, where there are no board states to influence calling a non-efficient house. If you look at these potential outcomes in a pie chart, you will see that even though you are most likely to only have a max of three of the same house in your starting hand, it's only a 55% chance. That means there's a 45% chance that you draw into four cards or more of the same house, which most players would agree to be an above average starting hand. That being said, going first is unique due to the first turn play limit. This changes the way we look at our starting hand composition when we're going first, since we need to be mindful of our second turn as well. A 3-2-2 split may be our worst possible outcome, but if one of our non-three card houses has a threat or otherwise great first turn play, then you're looking at a 3-2-1 split going into your second turn, which isn't too bad at all. If your house of three has a good creature to play, you can call the same house again next turn and use that creature, followed by two additional cards. Depending on the specific cards you draw, many of these house combinations can be worked favorably. Now, let's take a look at hands of six. The first thing that really surprised me was the probability of drawing a 2-2-2 two, two, two split was way lower than I thought it would be. Maybe it was just my personal bias, remembering some of my own terrible starting hands, but it's good to know that statistically, you aren't very likely to draw into an all-two split. In fact, you're actually more likely to draw into a hand that has four or more cards of the same house, with about a 25% chance. This also means that since having three cards of the same house is the worst hand we can have with seven, that there's only a 15% chance that as the first player, you will actually mulligan into a worse house composition. In a hand of five, our chances of drawing only two from a house almost triples, up to 42%. While that isn't ideal, the good news is that we are still more likely to draw at least three cards of the same house in our starting hand, which in this case is more than half of the five that we would have. After looking at the data, I think we can draw some conclusions. First off, three cards of the same house is an average starting hand, no matter how many cards we have. In seven, six, and five card hands, you will always be most likely to draw three cards of the same house. 
If you draw four or more cards of the same house, that can be considered an above average hand, and drawing two of each house on a hand of six is not good, even though it is unlikely. If you are going first, taking a mulligan is very safe. There's only a 15% chance that you will end up with the all two split, and you're more likely again to draw four cards or more of the same house than an all two. If you're going second, taking a mulligan does hurt a bit more, but you still have a 58% chance of drawing at least three cards of one house, if not more. In addition, that sixth card you were missing out on probably wasn't going to come into play anyways. The odds of it changing your three in-house to four is fairly low. Even if it changed one of your two card houses to three, you still can't guarantee the quality of the actual cards themselves. Forcing yourself to play with suboptimal cards first turn is not worth it compared to taking the mathematically sound risk to ensure better cards in your starting hand. The final thing to take into consideration when deciding to mulligan is if you think you can mulligan for a better starting hand. Ask yourself, what am I looking for? How does my deck win? Some decks are abundant with great opening plays, and in those cases, maybe an aggressive mulligan strategy to find those cards can be effective. I've created a table regarding the percentage of pulling specific cards in your starting hand. I did the math myself this time. If your deck has even three great first turn cards, the probability of you getting at least one of those cards in your starting hand becomes pretty high. If you have a lackluster starting hand and a 50% chance to draw into a mother or some other great first turn play, why wouldn't you try it? On the other hand, some decks simply don't have any standout first turn plays. In decks like this, maybe you're looking to establish an early board with specific creatures of the same house, or recycle your deck quickly. Maybe these decks value house composition in their starting hand more than the specific cards themselves. Maybe your deck wants to get to a strong start with cards from a particular house. If you're just looking for me to tell you whether to mulligan or not based on certain things, I simply can't do that. There is no black and white answer when taking a mulligan because every deck, every matchup is entirely unique. Good cards, bad cards, house composition, statistics, these are all important things to take into consideration when you're making your decision. But there are times when going against these guidelines might be the right play. There's only one way to get better at learning mulligans, and that is through playing your deck. Practice. I cannot stress how important practice, experience, and repetitions are with your deck. Sit down and draw yourself an opening hand and think about whether you would keep it or not. The beautiful thing about Keyforge is that you are the only owner of your deck. Through experience playing with a specific deck, you will come to learn what situations benefit you, specific cards and combos to look out for, and the overarching strategy of how your deck finds success. Things will change depending on the composition of your deck, as well as the deck of your opponent. A great starting hand against one deck might not be the best against a different one. Only you can learn to decide. That's all that I have for you all today. Hope you found the numbers as interesting as I did. There were definitely some statistics that surprised me. In our next episode, I plan on bringing all of our first turn knowledge together as we test out playing the first turn with specific decks. We'll be analyzing specific deck lists, trying to figure out ideal first turn plans for them, and seeing how the first few turns play out. Until then, thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, remember to get enough vitamin C, and I'll see you in the next one.